We are on Mars again, and in a country and a world that's getting buffeted by political storms, and in the United States, very real ones, I see conditions throughout much of the continental United States, and I see political conditions in Washington. It is sometimes wise to look up in the sky and see something good, something that the United States of America has done. For the eighth time, we are on the Martian surface. Although this is not your usual trip, we are there with a combination rover and helicopter and eventually a means by which samples that will be collected from the Martian surface will eventually, in future missions, be returned to Earth. It is staggering everything that had to go well in that seven minutes from orbit to touching down on the Jezero crater, believed maybe some billions of years ago to have sustained water or the means of life. It is going to be digging into that sediment, which can, well, see why NASA was digging all that it was hearing. This was welcome news. There are landings, and then there are historic ones like this. Welcome, everybody. I'm Neil Cavuto, and you're out of this world today. Uh, to put this in perspective, this was like trying to throw a dart from New York to Washington, sight unseen, and hit it right in the middle. That is a generous comparison. Statistically, something like this has never been done before. And this at a time when, right as we speak right now, China and the United Arab Emirates have spacecraft circling Mars at this time and eventually aim to land on that Martian surface in the very near future. We are there right now. This is the eighth successful Martian mission for the United States out of nine attempts. The Mars uh, you know, polar lander uh, crashed on entry, but still was able to record results back in 1999. But uh, other countries haven't come close to what is being mastered here. But this is a global achievement, and the magnitude of it, and getting back to the idea that we can find life and maybe the origins of life, and hence that we are not alone, is staggering the possibility. Some of the things that will make this interesting, and I want to pick up with the uh, former NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, of the fact that this will include the use of a helicopter. You heard me right, but it's not your traditional helicopter. And a rover and cameras, lots of them, 4K quality, and more than a dozen of them. Oh, yeah, and something else, two microphones to pick up sound on the Martian surface. I don't know why someone Never came up with that idea in, in, in the first place, but now it's going to be there. Jim Bridenstine, very good to have you. Thank you. I, I cannot Thank you. Great to be here. express enough. Same here, Jim. I cannot express enough just how remarkable this is. This isn't like any other mission I think we've ever seen uh, of the unmanned variety. There's a lot that they had to do just right, and they did it just right, right in this landing. What do you think? It's amazing. And I want to start by congratulating the NASA workforce and our contractors, the Jet Propulsion Lab, Caltech, um, all of the partners that helped put this together. Um, what an amazing day for NASA and for the United States. Uh, your level of, of, of excitement, Neil, um, is palpable, um, and I hope all of America feels that same way. Think about this. All of those missions that came before that you mentioned, this is the eighth time we've landed on Mars. All of those missions that came before, we learned that Mars at one time, the northern hemisphere was covered in water. Two-thirds of it was covered in water. We know that it had a thick atmosphere, that it had a magnetosphere that protected it from the radiation of deep space. We know these things because of these past missions. But now, for the first time, we actually sent an astrobiology mission to Mars if, if, if there was, in fact, past life on Mars. And, and just in the last two years, Neil, we have discovered that Mars is covered in complex organic, organic compounds. The building blocks of life exist all over Mars. They, of course, exist all over the Earth, but they're not on the moon at all. Zero on the moon, but they're all over Mars and they're all over Earth. We also know uh, that Mars very well could have had, could in fact, it does have even today, water, liquid water, 12 kilometers under its surface. And we know that the methane cycles of Mars match the seasons of Mars. All of this conspires to say that the probability of finding life on another world is going up, and it's going up rapidly. So it is perfectly appropriate that now 
we are sending an astrobiology mission to Mars, and we're going to one of the hardest places to land. This is why it's so important to congratulate the NASA workforce. They landed in the Jezero Crater, but not just in the Jezero Crater, at the River Delta. The, there is evidence of an ancient river there, um, and that river delta that flows into the crater, which used to be a lake bed, landing in that is one of the hardest things NASA has ever done. And it appears, as of right now, it appears that they have su successfully done that. The reason that matters is, if there is a chance to find signs of ancient life, that is the place to find it. So this is a very exciting day for NASA, for the United States, and, and certainly from me. Uh, congratulations to the amazing work of the NASA team. Yeah, I remember you were in the planning days for this, Jim. But what makes it remarkable is I, I was thinking, it. you know, it's landing in this crater. There are all sorts of boulders and everything there. It's been well, you know, photographed and all. So it was already fed all of this data to try to be like the Neil Armstrong of this vehicle, where in his case, in 1969, when he was landing on the moon, Turk Gurley Base, he discovered boulders and, and, and rocks that he had to, on his own, re-navigate that landing a little bit. But that was something that he saw. This was essentially trouble and act accordingly. And it was like a sequence. You needed the heat shield and everything had to be balanced and the degree hit coming in through the Martian surface. You needed the parachute, then the rocket thrusters, then the sky crane that lowered it into the crater and to avoid all those rocks in the crater. Man, oh man, if I'm watching this and I know there's an 11 minute delay just to get the signal back, I'm having palpitations at, at Cape Canaveral. Uh, I'm sure That's right. you've been through these sort of things. You are too, right? Yeah, and what makes this even more unique is the actual touchdown itself was done under uh, autonomous terrain relative navigation. So think, of a, think right. of a spacecraft that can actually see the surface and then make smart decisions. And all of this is done autonomously on a vehicle that was launched back in July. So this is, again, one of the most complex things NASA has ever done. Um, and it appears, yeah. I want to be clear, we haven't seen the pictures just yet, but it appears uh, that they have nailed it. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, now we're going to waiting for that first image, and you don't want, you know, some people think, oh my God, what if it landed upside down? It doesn't look like that's the case, so we don't know, but we'll yeah. see. But the helicopter thing, Jim, just blows me away. This thing can fly for 90 seconds at a time, 16 feet in the air. I guess it's going to take some aerial photos, um, and it can deal with the harsh Russian atmosphere, which is mostly carbon dioxide, right? And then all yeah. the cold, it's over 137 degrees below zero. That's got to be one strong little helicopter. It, it is. I'll tell you, it's very light. It's about four pounds. And of course, um, it, it's, it's unlike any other helicopter in the sense that the atmosphere on Mars is about one one hundredth that of the atmosphere here on Earth, which means it, it's, uh, the, the aerodynamics are very different. But here's what's, here's what's fundamentally transformational. How we explore worlds in the future, if this helicopter works, to be clear, this is a technology demonstrator, but if it works, this can fundamentally transform how we do exploration of other worlds in the future. And right now we have a mission called Dragonfly that's going to uh, you know, a moon of Saturn called Titan, and, and we're going to actually try to fly a helicopter on another moon of another world um, to, to get more science and more data than we've ever been able to get before. So this is just, this is a great time in space exploration. Um, and if this little helicopter, uh, we, we call it Ingenuity, um, named by a, a student, um, <laughs> if this little helicopter is successful, it's going to transform how we do exploration. You know what I think is really cool, Jim, is that you're going to, uh, I That's always right. think back in my mind, what if you, what if you landed on somebody, get off of me, I'm just saying that, but, but, um, uh, that's real. That, I always thought, why didn't Andrew do that before? Um, it seems like such a neat thing. I, I, I'm looking forward as much to hear as I am to see, uh, you know, th these images and sounds coming, you know, from the Martian side. That's right. And, and, and we're going to be able to get all kinds of weather data, if you can imagine that. So uh, when Fox News does its weather uh, broadcasting, you guys are going to call Jim Bridenstine and you're going to say, hey, uh, what's the weather like on Mars? And we'll be able to tell you the temperature, the pressure, the humidity. We'll be able to share with you what the dust storms are doing. There's all kinds of great sensors on this thing. That it's really transformational. Um, but more important oh, than it's, anything it's, else, it's are, wild. yeah, the, the capability okay. of assessing whether or not there was ancient life on Mars, it'll be transformational. Because if we do find that evidence, it's going to, I would imagine, 
you know, there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm um, for NASA's budgets to increase and for us to go do even more spectacular things. The question is going to be, if, if we find that there was ancient life on another world, the question is going to be, where else is it? And what else does life look like that's not on, on Earth? Um, you know, obviously, we haven't made that discovery just yet. Uh, but certainly, if that discovery happens, it's important that that discovery be made by the United States of America and our partners, and that we leverage that discovery to go um, add chapters to science books and history books. And that's what this is all about. Just amazing thing. It's been 50 years, right? I mean, you know, we first made, you know, these attempts to surf, you know, circle Mars and land on Mars and Viking in the 70s. And here we are now yeah. with rovers and helicopters yeah. and return flights to bring rocks back. It's just incredible. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time. Your enthusiasm, young man, is palpable. So thank you. Thank you. My honor. All right, Jim Bridenstine, I want to go to uh, Dr. Michio Kaku. Talk about a guy who's enthusiastic about this. Uh, all over the possibilities of this long before most. Uh, doctor, so good to have you. You know what is amazing, if you think about it, is, is eventually the goal is to get these sample specimens, you know, sediment and all that, back to Earth so to be studied. Now, it won't be done with this mission, but follow-up missions that are already being choreographed to hook up if this thing, you know, blasts off the surface, transfers a lot of this stuff to these new rockets and back to Earth. That is unprecedented. What do you make of it? That's right. Think of rock retrieval as a dress rehearsal, a mini dress rehearsal for astronaut retrieval. The steps that we're going to use to bring back rocks, that is, uh, have a lander there, collect samples, have an orbiter, go back to the orbiter, back to the planet Earth. Those are the same steps necessary to put humans on Mars and bring them back alive. So I see this as a mini dress rehearsal for the ultimate exploration, human exploration of Mars. Remember that in 2024 or so, we're going to go back to the moon, perhaps build an orbiter around the moon from which to build a Mars rocket. Or if you're Elon Musk, why not do it in just one big jump? So when you see this Mars mission, realize that this is the beginning, not the end, the beginning of a new era of space exploration. In the first era, we beat the Russians. OK, we did it. We beat the Russians. In the second <laughs> era, we're going into outer space to stay in outer space, explore the universe. You know, John Kennedy once famously said, it is in man's blood to look to the stars, to conquer the stars. Uh, he could have just as easily talked about planets and satellites like the moon. But this is one leap in a direction and complicated it so much by these very precise features to get this going and down to this rover that will span the moon, the, the Martian surface, then this helicopter. Um, that will be, you know, not only taking a look at images, but giving us heretofore sites unseen. What are some of the things you're looking for, Professor, or looking forward to? Well, you know, rock retrieval is going to be a game changer because we know that the conditions of Mars, once upon a time, a few billion years ago, it had, it had seas, it had oceans, but did it have life? And this could actually answer that key question. Are we alone? That is, is life only on the planet Earth or is it in outer space? And just remember, this has other implications as well. The dinosaurs, the dinosaurs did not have a space program. And that's why they're not here today to talk about it. They didn't have a Mars program. They didn't explore other worlds and they paid the price. They're no longer here. We do have a Mars program. We do have a space program. And this shows the ingenuity of NASA engineers, shows the tremendous technological superiority that we have in this country. Professor, I'm so glad to have you today. Um, you, you just put the right enthusiastic punch to it. And it is a historic day. Thank you. We're waiting for that first image to come. Uh, from the spacecraft here. Uh, but I'm so reminded of my friend Gene Cernan, the last man to walk on the moon, who said, you know, Neil, we are born to explore. We are born to acknowledge the times we live in and that we can't do this or won't do this. This, this attaches to our better assets, our better possibilities, our better frame of mind. When you push your mind, when you reach for the stars, 
when you grasp an opportunity like this, when everyone says, this is impossible. Moments ago, we learned something. It is not. And moments ago, we also learned that though it is very, very cold in much of the Atlantic coast right now, we're in New York City, it's 28 degrees, could be a little worse. On Mars right now, it's 137 degrees below zero. Stay with us.